Hello, everybody. My name is Nathan. I'm the host of Cleaning the Built World podcast. With me today is Jeffrey Peggett of JLL, our senior manager of savings delivery. Jeffrey, it's uh, amazing to meet you here on our podcast. Uh, we actually had a chance to connect in person um, just a few days ago. Um, if you don't mind letting our audience um, know a little bit more about yourself and your role. Thanks, Nathan. And thanks for having me on. It was great to see you downtown a couple of days ago. Fun to fun to always do those things. So as you mentioned, my name is Jeffrey Paget, and I do uh, I live and work out of just north of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Currently, 99% of my work is in the U.S., and I have an eye on APAC and EMEA, but don't tell anybody. Most of my history has been in first-generation outsourcing with a, a focus on the vision, the architects of success, and change management with a catalyst for uh, coaching. So most of my real estate has been in the critical infrastructure space, Fortune 100 companies, and uh, so critical infrastructure being call centers, data centers, and telcos. Fantastic. If you don't mind expecting maybe a little bit about how, you know, you kind of navigated your career and you know, how you ended up in a position where you could be driving savings delivery. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your, um, about your story. Fantastic. Sure. I've been in corporate real estate for about 25 years across Canada. I've done business in every city in, in, in Canada, every major city in Canada, lived across the West. I moved to Toronto in 2007 and been on both sides of the industry. So both been a service provider worked with a few of uh, the larger global service providers in the facility management area. I've also been a customer, so worked for some firms who owned a lot of real estate in downtown Toronto and just really loved the engagement and had the opportunity to work with some large firms and ha had the opportunity to really deliver some cultural changes. So not only driving savings and, or procurement activities, but everything from leasing to facility management to project delivery uh, even did some forward-looking asset asset validation and forward-looking consolidation and expansion of corporate real estate. Fascinating stuff and uh, just loved all of that. So that's how I got here. I have a passion for corporate real estate, love the engagement with vendors and partners and, uh, and can't get enough of it. So I always get closer to the, to the risk profile because that's where all the action is. Amazing. I would love to, to dive into the specifics of those. Um, just a moment, but I wanted to tell the audience, originally to my if you LinkedIn, you commented on a page that both BSCs, facility and property managers have vested on to share in successes and savings. Um, maybe if you don't mind, you know, just kind of based on, on your long history, can you share a real life example of where be a, a building service provider and your team have worked together to achieve cost savings uh, or some of these operational improvements? I sure can. So you, you mentioned the word vested and I did see your podcast because my close friend, George Woodsalis was on there with impact and George, George and I go way back. So to impact and I go way back. So it caught my eye that he took the time to do that. So that's how I, I got in there. And you mentioned the word uh, vested, which is a program out of the university of Tennessee that. I'm really proud of, and I'm really engaged with Kate Vistastic. I pronounced that wrong. She's a legend and I've worked with her in person. I've worked with her. She works with Nobel prize winning economists. She does globe. She helps people do global deals and gets in the room. She's worked with, I've been in the room with her, with a, with a client that we had a fascinating engagement. And there really is a way to do that. There re really is a way to, and I, what's the phrase manage vendors. There is a way to work with vendors to get the right outcome, turn them into partners, and really have a, a, a central goal of executing excellence. So as an example, we had a, in my past, I was managing a, a 2000 location logistics firm across North America and in APAC, and it happened to be the time when the pandemic hurt, hit, sorry. The, at that time, we had 30 or 40 different janitorial vendors. As you can imagine, the scopes were not consistent. The responses weren't consistent. The reporting wasn't consistent. Everybody was given everybody orders and it was a mess. About two months before the pandemic took a full hold, we had consolidated those down to three across Canada. We were in transition in the US. Uh, we hadn't touched uh, APAC at that time. And so the timing was fantastic the ability for us to be able to manage that. And if you want to talk about the Toronto market, because that's where we're all sitting, we had some large pieces of real estate here with 
2,000 employees wandering through there every week. You can imagine that management of that and, and the coordination of that communication for that, both from a technical perspective, when you're dealing with the pandemic updates, documentation, and we had cleaning partners, impact was one of them to be able to execute that for us. And you can't put any of that into contracts or in work orders or in discussions. When those things come up, that's where a partnership comes in and it stops becoming about checking boxes and it becomes about the, the real mission. We, we talked a little bit about how um, very large client um, and it's, you know, kind of various needs across the country and a uh, very rapidly growing client. So I'd love to get a sense of some of your priorities in terms of this upcoming year. So obviously, you know, I think we're, we're through the, the majority of, you know, what, what the pandemic we have brought. Obviously we are in a new world. Yeah. Suspicions for, for janitorial and cleaning. That was one of the hot topics. So for 2024, what do you look at some of your things to improve alignment with some of your service for say overall to drive savings through some of your vendors, including in janitorial? For sure. So I can, I can talk a bit about that. I won't get too specific about, uh, about any client activity, but I can sure talk about all of, all of those similar strategies that we all have. So being in critical real estate, it's a little different critical infrastructure, critical real estate, uh, everything's operating seven by 24 global clients. It's always top of mind to make sure those things are happening. Janitorial is, uh, is a focus for us in 2024, 2025. And for some of the same reasons we've already discussed, you get into the scopes move because locals try and be helpful. Vendor partners try and be helpful and things move and we lose track of what we're there for. We, we start doing extras without being thanked. We start doing extras without getting paid until the bill comes and everybody's surprised. So my goal for next year, as is across our, our organization globally, or from the America's perspective would be to drive some of those efficiencies. And you mentioned I had the title of savings delivery. Now I'm more account specific and savings delivery isn't just a pricing exercise. You will never see me use the word best price or lowest price in any of my LinkedIn posts or when everybody gives me a microphone or puts me on the stage. That is, that, that is, you can look at many, many different articles and I hope we get to talk about them today about that's a short term view. There's a lot of other things that we can do to be better partners and do that. So I could, I would say that would be my focus in 2020 now and 2024, 2025, not only for the janitorial space, but for some of the other categories that we're involved with. Thank you. And, um, I think one of the things that we chatted about over at Coxie was sort of your, your viewpoint, of property managers and facility managers, uh, necessarily the same thing. I mean, this is a. This nowhere, commonly misunderstood concepts for many people. Maybe uh, would you like to read on and your viewpoint towards property management and facility management? Sure. Yes. As everyone knows who's known me and, and had a coffee with me knows I have a very strong opinion on that and have had for 20 years. They are completely different disciplines, property managers and facility managers. They are, they have two different focuses, two different disciplines. At a very macro level, you could talk about a property manager who's focused on his or her asset. They're focused on the outdoors. They're focusing on keeping the chillers and the boilers running to supply the tenants in the building. As a facility manager, you're working almost embedded with the clients or not almost embedded with the clients, living within their culture, living within their day-to-day -day activities, everything from moving people from desk to desk making sure their facility is clean and presentable for their staff so they can have staff retention for their clients when they come in, making sure that the, the property team and the landlords are doing what they should be doing to support that tenant space, keeping an eye on when that tenant space is coming up. And as far as when we get back into janitorial, the facility management team is, is highly integrated to the janitorial team for a number of reasons where the base building property management vertical really isn't because they're focused on, again, if we look at it very, very base building, they're looking at cleaning the lobby, cleaning the elevator lobbies and the tenant space they stay out of. You know, if, if I have control over the facility management, I never let landlords do my cleaning just because it's a different focus. So we need to help. Facility management is much more in touch with the tenant 
as much more in touch with the janitorial team because janitorial teams can be large. They see a lot of things. They can be your eyes and ears, so to speak. They can also have an impact on you get, you still get those work order complaints and you get, oh, they missed the spot. There's this facility managers have a big lift in making sure that that message is crisp and clear to avoid anything before it happens. And you mentioned you, I mean, you proudly, proudly mentioned that you came from an operational facilities and yourself. Absolutely correct. I'm, I would, when I introduce myself to people, I tell them I'm a corporate real estate guy. And I happen to do uh, sourcing and, and procurement at this time. I've managed clients. I've done many, many leases in my day. I've executed thousands of vendor agreements, procured new real estate, moved out of old real estate, done vent, let landlord management plans, rebuilt hundreds of national agreements and national scopes and national programs, spoke at some, at a few trade shows, spoke at a few of our vendor partners year-end events because they wanted the voice of a customer and what perspectives were. So yeah, so sourcing is only a part of, of what I do and what my history is. So I know I look young, but I'm really old. I've been around for a while. No, no, it, it doesn't show at all. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I, I think, you know, I think it hits on a really salient point. Obviously there's, there's no, you know, one way to do things, but in, in bringing you know, operational into that you are now, you absolutely can have that context of what, what do tenants care about on a day-to-day -day basis? And what are the things that can go wrong on the ground? You know, except, you know, the, the people that are really paying for you know, all of these, these buildings, it's really tenants and rents and all sorts of things. Uh, I think what, when it comes down to it, the key aspect the most operational folks and facilities even the vendors, like the janitorial programs, was communication. You know, like you, we've talked a lot here about partnership and communication. Uh, I'd love to kind of bring up that topic and expand a little bit. Personally speaking from yourself as an operational leader, what level of communication are you expecting from your service providers? You know, for example, Nero, obviously, we, we try to improve that transparency between janitorial provider to the uh, facility, but, you know, from, from sitting where you are today, you know, what level of, you know, clarity, information, reporting, you know, just in terms of communication overall, are you expecting, what would you like to see? Or it's a crazy balance depending on the category of services. So if we talk about a few different ones, janitorial being one of them, they become jan janitorial teams or housekeeping teams become part of the team and sometimes they can just become invisible. What I like to see, so right now I touch 50, 60, 70 sites across America. There's no way I can talk to every single one of those teams, of those housekeeping teams or janitorial teams. We have other leadership that's in those sites. For instance, I was in a, in the, Go back to the example of before where we had 1800 sites across North America in the food service industry, we had 15, 20 sites across uh, North America. It's really hard to get down to those base levels. So you need to rely on the vendor partner to understand where those points are because everyone has a variety of different touch points. So I can do a national deal, but then the guy in Vancouver or the guy in Arizona or the guy in Texas has to live and deal with the facility team at that site and keep them happy and also has to has to make sure they're aligned with the services that they're providing and make sure they're doing everything that we had agreed to and we're focusing on the outcomes of those and get away from the check boxes so do we have quarterly meetings with those people absolutely do we have incident if there's an issue do we have an escalation call absolutely do i always look for organizations to reach out. One of the things that you and I talked about, Nathan, was, you know, what's one thing that, that, that service providers don't do enough of? And, and to me, that is reporting successes. Or you will also hear me talk about having a recommendation, a recommendation culture. And that means you're too young, but in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, every vendor would come up and say, how do I take your pain away from you? And how do I make you look good? I've seen that so many, I can get that in the yellow pages. So and that's an old phone book for those out there that don't know what that is. I always look for a recommendation culture of people with 
industry knowledge that understand our business, understand my business, and can then come in and say, I know this is what you're asking us to do. That works perfectly. We're all doing great. Happy days. Or they come in and they say, here's what you're asking us to do. I know that's a contractual obligation. Here's some other things that maybe you could think of, and here's some of the advantages to those. And here's what we're seeing coming in two or three years from now. That is the magic in this industry today. And it's rare. And sometimes I go looking for it with, I know long-term partners. And when I find those organizations that are willing to do that and have those candid conversations and not all of them are correct and nor should they be, that's the magic in this industry, in my humble opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love that. I love that sentiment. I think that's you know, some of the, the change that, you know, we, we'd love to, we'd love to see as well, because, you know, I think this is not, right. not only a financial, um, but as well, I think in, in just overall kind of performance, I think, uh, I think one, you know, tongue in cheek perhaps thing that we discussed was the aspect of, you know, no news is good news, it's, you know, in, in the world of janitorial, maybe that is the norm. Can you comment on? what some of maybe your fellow managers are missing out when they take the no news is good news approach uh, in their communication. I, I think as, as we discussed and you see my shake my head at that, you know, when I write my book, that's going to be chapter four that no news is never good news. Sometimes it is because we have our head in the sand and it's not that critical and we ignore it. I've seen so many issues come up that could have been solved if somebody just put their hand up and said, something's not right here. We should talk about this versus letting it explode and then it becomes an issue and then it becomes the finger pointing. And, and it, be, it, and we get there, Nathan, just because everyone wants to be helpful. Everyone in, especially in the, in the janitorial and housekeeping world, yes, is always the answer. And I understand that because when a client asks you something, the natural response is to say yes, right away, do it today, do it tonight. There's a time and a place for that, but that all comes back to that vested relationship and that vested partnership to be able to say, understand the ask, let me get back to you and then circle it through the right places. Or if there's something not happening or there's something missed or they notice something, or even on the, on the client side, as, as us hiring those service providers, if we see something happening and we ignore it, that's not okay for us either. We should put our hand up and say, why is this happening? What's going on and how do we get here? And and sometimes that's the race to the bottom where we used to have 30 people that could find it. As soon as a piece of Kleenex hit the floor, there was four guys jumping on it like at Disney World. Those days are gone. So we have to rely on just the good old fashioned common sense and, and putting your hand up when there's gaps. And if we're missing routines and things are getting messy or there's a lot of movement in, in our industries, people changing roles, trying to get better. So it's hard to be, hard to be consistent. And that's, that, that is difficult and that will never change. And, and I think that really segues very, very to, you know, sort of the, the topic of, you know, finding a building service contractor. So in our, in our business, you know, we, we work with hundreds of janitorial companies and, and you know, I think a lot of them are trying to find new ways to, you know, stand down or to, to say it bloodly and to look good to potential clients. And so from Sydney, from the perspective that you are, Jill, what are some of the top things that we look for when selecting a building service? Can you share some of the factors that may contribute um, to a winning bid, uh, even if it's not the lowest priced option? Sure. And, and there are times that we do formal RFPs and a lot of those are and that's not just a JLL thing. I, I've done that in my past. Look at my LinkedIn of who I've wor worked with and, and the clients that I've worked with. Our RFPs can serve a, serve a purpose if they're written correctly and not just cut and paste and thrown out there. You can align some scopes. You can realign the best regions because organizations change and shift. And, uh, you know, there's opportunities for that. So I don't want anyone to think that, that everything's the answer to everything is just do an RFP because that's challenging. And they're expensive to respond to, especially the larger scale ones. Uh, to answer your question, what do, what do I look for? So for 20 years, I've, I've been on the service provider side, which means I've had hundreds of people or thousands of people calling me randomly, telling me how they can be helpful. And some of those have turned into great friendships and great partnerships, and, and a lot of them haven't. So today, what I look for, Nathan, especially given the clients that I'm talking to both in America and hopefully in, in Europe and in Asia, we need to understand that they're 
have the sophistication to to do the work in our space. You know, it's the same thing. Can can the same vendor do work in downtown Manhattan that can do it in uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa? Probably not. They're different. They're it's a different approach, and you need to understand that. So, three things: I would look for scale. I would look for the leadership of that firm, and do I have access to them, and not just on the sales side. And uh, technology. Technology is a word that you and I talked about that gets thrown around a lot. Do they have the ability to manage the administration that large organizations require today? Everyone says they do. And even large organizations struggle with it if you don't set them up correctly on the front end and help integrate them. The other would be the culture of that organization. Going back to my recommendation culture, do they have industry experience or do they use words like we can do that? I would rather work with people who do do that. But if there are organizations who I really like and really have potential and that really fit and uh, that have been vetted correctly with the other people on my team and, and in those client spaces, can we help them be great? Absolutely. That's, that's part of the, that's part of the growing together. Do you have, you brought up technology and you know, to actually build a hub. Sure. A bit. When we, when we talked the other day, you know, obviously we talked about you know, there may be dozens of technologies in place at any given time. For instance, a huge organization like JOL. And you know, I guess one of the challenges, you know, we think more when you simply integrate, even just get value, single source technology. And so, you know, something be in place just for one particular use case. Let's talk a little bit in technologies that you've seen worked. How they implemented that, maybe the event, then you were a fiduciary of it. Maybe you brought it in yourself and you had to use it. Maybe just talk to me about some of those mechanisms that you've seen be successful in. Absolutely. And, and I will come back to how that impacts in, in the housekeeping and the janitorial and the supplies, the supply space. Uh, you know, there are thousands of technology platforms. Every organization's got a hundred of them. You know, you've known me for a couple of weeks in person. And you hear me talk about having that vested integration of said technology. Do those platforms talk to each other and do they drive? You and I talked yesterday about uh, data. Everybody's got data. How do you take that data and turn that into actionable business intelligence to drive decisions? And again, I, I, I didn't read that out of the Harvard Business Review. <laughs> that I've been saying that for a long time, just because how many organizations go back to the fundamentals not back to clipboards and walking around or taking notes. And, and then, so how do we do that as service providers to help manage our business? Especially when you're talking about assets, you're talking about activity tracking, you're talking about financials, you're talking about trend information. All of those things are critically important, whether you're talking about typical occupied corporate real estate, or if you're talking about in the data center space, or if you're talking about in logistics space or industrial. All of that is critically important, especially with financials becoming so critical. The cost of money has gone up, so capital's not as easy to get. You need to have that data and those accurate results. You also need that data to be integrated. So going back to housekeeping and janitorial. So depending on, you know, you can talk about supply ordering. You can talk about, was it 10, 15 years ago when we used to put QR codes on doors? So we would ask our housekeeping teams to go scan the door every time they went by and see how that looks. How much time are we spending in bathrooms? We would have them sign the back of a door to make sure that they did it 15 minutes ago so that if it was dirty, somebody didn't, we could say, no, no, they were here 15 minutes ago. It's not our fault. How does that get better? And I think you guys have a platform to help that and to fix some of that still takes the human side to understand it and know what those indicators are. I'm, I'm a big technology fan. I don't, I think some people and some organizations get lost in the buzzwords and in the data. Going back to my earlier point, everyone, there's not a company around that doesn't have a million data points. It's the magic is to take that into here is what we have. How do we turn that into actionable intelligence to tell us where we were, where we are? The true value, the true magic, the true enterprise, pick your word, is what, what does that mean for us in six months? That's the magic. And how do we take that back to our vendor partners to say, here's what we see. Is this real? 
And should we change that? If not, how do we copy that everywhere else? And how do our vendor partners that use their own platform technology integrate with ours? That gets complicated, but it's doable. Yeah, I think that that hits on, on a really key point in, in that, you know, I think you're leveraging a solution for, you know, you, 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 may, you may purchase a solution or technology for one particular use case, but once it's in place, you can you absolutely leverage it for, for much, much more. And I think, you know, just as you're saying, you know, it's one thing to know the cleaners were here, but maybe that next step or the next kind of piece of value is, you know, how, how do you use that information to evaluate the performance or to evaluate um, kind of based on expectation, how some of that work was done. Think not. Not to yeah. cut you off, but think about yeah. through the pandemic when all these buildings were empty and we and and some firms, some property managers, some facility managers still had janitors running around checking things. But so there's nobody on the floor. I think the panic suddenly hit everything and say moving forward, one is looking to almost kind of fully back in the other direction, if not even further. Correct. Yeah, and I'd love to hear your perspective, um, Ben. Moving forward, do you measure the performance of your your cleaning organizations and, and janitorial providers? Do you have any metrics or criteria that you use in order to determine if they're meeting the expectation um in, in delivering quality service? It's it's both qualitative and quantitative. It, then, it's sometimes hard to measure because it is so subjective. I've had thousands of debates when I would use the expression about clean doesn't smell. Sometimes people would say Ask George, and we agree on that, to be clear, because many people would say that, you know, the illusion that a bathroom isn't clean, so they would install those spritzers that sprayed lemon scent until somebody was allergic, and then you spent $10,000 pulling everything out. Clean doesn't smell is, is, I've been saying that for 20 years. It's, I think how you measure that would be dependent on the kind of real estate you have. We can go back in time and, and look at, we, I still see scopes today. When people try and talk to me about doing business with me today, whether it's on the data center account that I'm involved with or the other accounts that I've supported over the past, the past year, and it's always comes down to frequencies and how often and head counts, we need to get back to, there is a better way to do that. I'm not sure I'm there yet. However, we will be absolutely. And so how do you measure that? Do you measure that on a cost per square foot basis? Do you measure that on a frequency basis on a head count? I had discussions with, with, I was at the uh, Remy Awards a couple of nights ago, downtown Toronto and had a conversation with some people I haven't seen in a long time. And we went down a rabbit hole of exactly this and it became the, you know, and I use the expression, you know, why do we even still have whiteboards? Like, don't we have better technology than that anymore? And he, he made the comment about, they had that conversation with some of their housekeeping teams because somebody got in trouble for leaving a half an hour early. I think we really need to change that methodology that if, that if the work is done and the cleaning's done and you really want to pay them for their 40 hours a week, that's fantastic. But if all of their core duties are done, is there nothing else we could get them to do or involve them in to lighten up their day or to add value to what they do or to give them a different perspective? So how do we measure housekeeping and janitorial, I think is still evolving. Uh, You and I both know that a lot of people still go off. If no one's complaining, it must be okay. I'm not a believer in that. We do do uh, tours both in independently and with our partners and with our clients just to make sure because they are client facing facilities. Like every client I've touched in the past 20 years, they've always have the opportunity of a client walking in. So it needs to be presentable and, and that's part of it. Is it right. costs? Is it supplies? Is it the use of supplies? All of those things kind of roll up into a, is that a score? Is that a, is, is that a red light, green light? There's different. Yeah. And I think, again, another, another good point to kind of build off is, you know, kind of within the cleaning scope, you know, say, for example, there are things that are, are being done. I mean, maybe there's a vacant floor, maybe there's you know, kind of an empty space. And I mean, kind of from your perspective, you know, obviously those need to be checked, but maybe not the way you would sure. over our tenants. And so can we talk a little bit about how you go about scope within, you know, within your, your, you know, in that of the existing client or on the tennis client, because obviously, you know, there's one way to do things, which is completely static. Everything stays the same and this is exactly what we need. But I think there's a growing trend 
of especially nowadays where more and more companies are saying, okay, let's allocate some of this time into more critical areas, or maybe even, like you said, reduce some of some of the load so that some of the savings can be drawn to us and the facility manager. Can, can you talk a little bit about how scope changes can occur uh, within a existing um, scope of work? I'll, I'll, go, I'll go down two paths with that. So we talked about, we talk about scope creep. So there's the, the, again, the housekeeping divisions and the janitorial divisions are always so visible and they're always so accessible because they're always so nice. And everybody will come up and say, oh, by the way, do you mind doing this? And do you mind doing that? And can you give this an extra touch? And I'm special. So my office needs a wipe every week and not every month and all those kinds of things. And again, the answer is always yes, sir. Right, right now, sir. Yeah. And again, not, not always the right answer, but it happens all the time. It happens today. And uh, so then those things build up and all of a sudden we can't figure out why the core, why the, why the vacuuming isn't happening or the, the elevator lobbies look a little sketchy and it's because while well, we've been helping the person down the hall and their office is perfect and they're happy. So that's the, that's the balance. That's the life of a, a facility management team is to figure that out. And the facility managers that have, that have worked on my teams, we've had those discussions a thousand times. If we go back in time to when I managed the call center industry across Canada, 14 sites from Nanaimo, BC to St. John, New Brunswick. You can imagine the scale of that cleaning 24 hour call centers, contact centers in Surrey, BC, for instance, we had 4,000 staff rolling through that place. It was an old Rona that we converted into a call center. We had giant cleaning teams. You can imagine the loads on those bathrooms, but there was shift changes. There was client changes. There was times and no one wants to be the person to go to the cleaning company and say, we need to shed 35 people for three months. Cause that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to do. It's easy to ask, but it's hard for them to do. And then when you need them back, it gets even more complicated mm -hmm. and it's just not fair. Sometimes, um, there's a way to do that. And so many times we re redistributed that labor. Can they move furniture around? Can they help us with low work? Can we do some handyman type activities as long as they were skilled and safe. I did lots of that back in the day mm -hmm. and it was appreciated both from the staff side because they got to see something different. I got to improve some things, got to keep paying people, keep them engaged. They knew we cared and, and, and it's hard to do. But when it comes to a formal scope change, again, those go back to that recommendation culture that goes back to that engagement to say, we keep doing this all the time and we really don't understand why. And sometimes the answer is because we want you to, and sometimes the answer is really, okay, let's talk about that. And then we can make that change and set those expectations. Again, you and I talked about what one of the challenges is I, I can agree to a lot of things. I can put it all in contracts and I can, I can push that all out in, into 15, 20 emails. And, but does that really get down to the staff level where they expect that their desk is going to be cleaned every night? And I changed mm -hmm. it to every month and. Did we tell everybody it's hard to, and it's hard for people to remember all of that stuff, but the, the housekeeping teams and the janitorial teams have to live with those consequences and we need to be there to, there to support them. And if they make a suggestion, we should embrace that. And I mean, I think that's, it's a really good way to start to have a conversation with you have touched on so many critical topics building service contractors, property managers, facility managers, uh, and even tenants can, can, can glean some value to, to learn a little bit more about the industry. So, you know, one of my, my last uh, things to, to ask of New Year is, you know, what is one of the biggest things that you disagree with most in this industry or something that may be taken for granted in the world of facility manager? Wow. That's a, that's not a loaded question at all, Nathan. You haven't even known me that long to, to well, beat me like that. I, th I think one of the things that that annoys me the most is I think you have a lot of firms that put an enormous amount of time into winning business and they will, they will send in their guys in the best suits and the best shoes. And, and they're always on time and always so friendly, the deal gets done, a contract gets signed and then everybody disappears. And uh, that's not just in the housekeeping and janitorial business. That's in a lot of categories that's kind of going away, but it's still around and I often hear people, well, we have a signed contract. Doesn't that mean exclusivity? We have a signed contract. Doesn't that mean this? And I, I think we all just need to be aware um, that yes, contracts are important. 
Yes, partnerships are important. Again, if you read any of the supporting documentation in the corporate real estate world, again, I'm a big fan of Kate. She's got great articles in the Harvard Business Review, posts them on Cornet all the time about that partnership is important. Yes, there's times and places for it. I've done it. I've seen it done. And I'm constantly trying to talk about it. But sometimes when I hear people say, well, we have a contract. What's the problem? It's like, okay, we shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to pull that card out every time because there's lots of clauses in there too. So careful. And I want to give you an opportunity also to talk about, yeah, you said maybe full or some piece of thought leadership very both on LinkedIn, but as well within the industry. So if there's any, anything you'd like to promote true to our needs, please feel free. Again, I've talked about Kate a lot and I'm a fan and I, it, it's hilarious because of all the work I do in the U.S. when I wear an orange shirt, an orange business shirt or an orange uh, t-shirt with a collar. Um, they always think I'm from Tennessee and, and cheer mm-hmm. for some football team that I don't know. Look quite funny, but I, I would always encourage people to to listen to a variety of sources. If you if you follow your uh, your corporate real estate associations like the Cornets, like the IFMAs or uh, 7x24, the event I'm going to tonight, pay attention, do some research. Uh, that's probably one of the things I should do more is do more reading and also get out and talk to your fellow peers, go tour their real estate, go understand what they're doing, go get their perspective. And it's so easy to be siloed, especially after the pandemic. I, I, if you can, I strongly encourage that and understand where they're, where they're gleaning their information from and uh, just take a very pragmatic approach and, and go from there. That's, that would be my only two cents. Amazing. Jeffrey, you've been extremely accommodating and generous with your time. Very appreciate the opportunity to, to both connect here on, on the podcast, but as well earlier in person. And I think this is definitely going to be the streaming in a long-term working relationship. And I say, if there's any closing words that you'd like to provide, I feel, please feel free. I would just like to thank you for this opportunity and thank you for the time to meet you in person. And, and we will do this again in 2024 and please keep safe over the, the holidays and uh, that are upcoming and as well what's 2024 should be a, a spectacular year for the markets and the real estate and all those good things so let's just ride the wave I look forward to it thank you very much keep safe everybody